Welcome to BioCentury this week. I'm Jeff Cranmer, Executive Editor of BioCentury, and I'm joined by... Karen Takach tusman Senior Editor. Steve Austin, Washington Editor. On this week's pod, next generation NK cell enhancements in the clinic, Janet Woodcock's new role at FDA, and BMS is pulling out of Russia. What does it mean? Why did they do it? And user fees are advancing in the House and Senate. What's in, what's out, and what can we expect in the final legislation? But first, BioCentury This Week is brought to you by MSD. MSD, which is also known as Merck Co., has a strong history of success in translating cutting-edge research into life-saving medical breakthroughs. The Pharma's European Innovation Hub, located in London, is embedded in one of Europe's key scientific communities to drive engagement with local academia, biotech, peer pharma, and VCs. The hub includes a business development and licensing team, clinical teams, and the pharma's UK discovery research sector. MSD is located in Kenilworth, New Jersey. For more information, visit msd.com slash licensing. Last week's cover story in BioCentury was written by staff writer Danielle Golovin, and it detailed the landscape for NK cell companies. Here to talk about it is BioCentury senior editor Karen Takach Tosman. Karen, you edited the piece. What did you learn? Well, uh, it was a moment to just sort of take stock of what are the NK cell therapies in the clinic and what are the enhancements um, that are being pioneered there and, and what does the data show so far? So looking at that, among modified NK cells, there's a kind of a cluster of top modifications that people are testing in the clinic. One is adding a CAR, uh, which directs the NK cells to a specific tumor antigen and also induces killing pathways uh, downstream of CAR signaling. Another, which is sometimes done in conjunction with the CAR, is using CD16, either the endogenous CD16, which is the FC receptor uh, on it, NK cells, or adding an engineered FC receptor to activate um, antibody-mediated cellular cytotoxicity, or ADCC, which is a, a somewhat different killing pathway that can be engaged also by the NK cell. And uh, the other being adding IL-15, um, so engineering the cells to secrete their own IL-15, for example, or having a receptor that kind of maintains IL-15 signaling on the cells. And so it was interesting to see that these are really the kind of top three modifications being pioneered. And I think most of the clinical data we're seeing so far centers around CARs. Uh, what are the effects of adding CARs to NK cells? And so far, it seems promising. There's been data from Encarta last month, for example, suggesting that two of off-the-shelf NK cell therapies that they have, have derived from healthy donor blood have response rates similar to approved autologous CAR T cells. Um, and there's also data we've been following from Takeda, Immunity Bio, and also from uh, FATE. The FATE data is interesting because some data presented at the American Society of Cell and Gene Therapy meeting last week brought on some questions about the durability of NK cell therapies. And that was in a case without CARs. And so now they've got some next generation products where they're adding cars. And so it'll be interesting to see how the durability data continues stacking up there. So yeah, probably interesting things to look out for at ASCO this year. Excellent. What's coming up behind these on the preclinical front, Karen? Well, preclinically, there's definitely a broader set of modifications that are being tested out. And at ASGCT last month. Uh, Danielle also did some great roundups there, including a deep dive into uh, neuro-targeted AAVs, but that's uh, you can check that out separately. But one of the things she highlighted was presentations from Catamaran Bio and Senti Biosciences 
about the engineering strategies they're employing to enhance the potency of their car and K cells. So for catamaran, that includes a dominant negative TGF beta receptor that traps TGF beta in the microenvironment to reduce immunosuppression. And they've coupled that with a HER2 car. And Senti had um, this interesting trio of abstracts where they showcase some of their logic gated car technology. So this is when you have a Boolean system of uh, you can target this antigen and that one. So you get both uh, leukemic stem cells and the bulk tumor of AML, but not this other antigen, EMCN, which is more expressed on healthy cells. And they also have some characterization of genetic circuits, for example, to calibrate release of cytokines like IL-15 and IL-12. So definitely the modifications get more varied as we look into the preclinical realm, and it'll be interesting to see how those develop as well. All right. This story is online at biocentry.com. It's one of my favorite types of stories that we do because uh, it is a landscape piece. It has at least two pipeline charts, a cool graphic showing you how things work, and a company named Cheetah, which who can deny how good that is. All right, let's take a ride down Washington Metro's red line to the hamlet of Silver Spring, Maryland. In a career spanning 35 years at FDA, Janet Woodcock has transformed the way drugs are regulated. And in the process, she's changed the pathway from the lab to the bedside. She was director of FDA's CEDAR twice, and now she has a new job. Steve, what is it? Jeff, first I have to say the red line doesn't go to FDA, unfortunately. The only way to get out there is a long and rather arduous drive on the Beltway or Uber or something like that. Oh my goodness. It goes to Silver Spring though. That's like the second busiest red line stop after Shady Grove. I, I spent some time in your town. It does go to Silver Spring, but um, it's an awfully long way from the Silver Spring Metro oh my. <laughs> out to, to White Oak where FDA is, unfortunately. Anyway, so what's she going to be doing? Rob Califf had an all hands memo that he sent out last week. He said that Janet Woodcock, who's now the principal deputy commissioner, is going to focus on priorities mostly outside of medical products and tobacco regulation. Uh, he mentioned food nutrition, inspectional oversight, animal drugs, devices, food, information technology, FDA's budget, and operational matters. I contacted Janet. She spoke with me briefly, said that she has been pulled into some medical product issues since Dr. Califf was sworn in as commissioner, but those aren't her main area of emphasis. And she said that she's going to be focusing primarily on cross-agency products that will improve operations, particularly those supported by IT. I think the general idea is that FDA has struggled for decades with its IT systems, with other aspects of its operations. And what Janet Woodcock wants to do is to basically bring them into the 21st century so the agency can free up, can be more efficient, free up some of its staff to do more innovative things and, you know, to keep up with the really rapidly advancing technology. And also, I think, to really focus on some of the struggles it's had in areas that aren't funded by user fees, the problems that it's having now, that the country's having now with infant formula is an example of how important FDA's activities outside of medical products really are. Steve, the other big story you were on, well, there, there was actually a few last week. One of the other big stories you were on, Bristol Myers became the first multinational pharma to withdraw from Russia following that country's invasion of Ukraine. How did BMS arrive at this decision? And are there other companies that are likely to follow suit? So BMS initially did what all of the other big farmers have done, which is to say that they cut off non-essential drugs and products that they might have been selling in Russia, that's probably less relevant for Bristol Myers than it is for a big company like J&J, &J, say. They stopped enrolling new patients in their clinical trials in Russia. They stopped marketing activities in Russia. And by the way, they also ramped up their humanitarian aid to Ukraine. 
What they've done now is to say that they're closing down in Russia. They have 170 staff there. They don't have any manufacturing plants there. So it's easier for them than it is for some of the other companies. But they haven't said that they're going to stop selling their products there. What they've done instead is to say that they're going to shift all of their sales to Russia to a third party, a company called Swix, S-W-I-X-X, which is in Switzerland. And Swix is an interesting company. They started in 2014, and their explicit mission is to act essentially as, a, as the eyes and ears of companies in places in Central and Eastern Europe where multinational companies either don't want to have a footprint or like Bristol Myers, they want to withdraw from those markets. So Swix is still going to sell Bristol Myers products in Russia. Most of Bristol Myers staff have been given an opportunity to move over and become employees of Swix. So for Russian patients, it might not have as big an effect as you'd think, but for Bristol Myers, it allows them to, you know, to disengage with Russia and at the same time to meet what they believe are their humanitarian obligations to the country. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see other companies making similar moves. Functionally, what do you think is the difference then between this third party route and directly being in the country? I think that it, it allows Bristol Myers to say to the world and also to its own staff around the world that it's disengaged with Russia, it's not going to have direct interactions with the Russian government, with institutions in Russia. There aren't going to be issues of collaborations with the uh, Russian institutions in the future. I think the other thing that's really important, and the importance of it has been um, overlooked, is that Bristol Myers has not only said, like the other companies, that it's not going to enroll new patients in clinical trials, but it, it said that it's shutting down clinical trials that are in progress. And it said it's gonna do what it can to try to help the patients who are in those trials to continue to receive access to drugs. It sounds to me like that may not be possible in 100% of cases. And it's actually taking a step of shutting down trials that are ongoing there. We've seen in some cases, companies that have cut off supplies for clinical trials in Russia, actually it's more consequential than you would think. A lot of people in Russia and Eastern Europe their best, and in some cases, their only way to access effective therapies is by participating in clinical trials. So that's going to be impactful for them. I think I mentioned it on the podcast uh, a week or two ago. There's a, a German company that cut off access to CAR T therapies for Russian institutions that were using them in investigational trials that were life saving, were the only opportunities that some pediatric cancer patients in Russia had really to live. So I think that it's going to have a bigger impact than it sounds just on the face of it. Yeah, and, and Steve, as you wrote, according to clinicaltrials.gov, this decision by BMS could affect patients in more than 50 trials and include everything from treatments for prostate, breast, renal, and other cancers, as well as forms of arthritis. Crohn's disease and other conditions. We should also note that BMS and its foundation have donated more than a million dollars to relief efforts in Ukraine. That's according to a roundup of drug company contributions collated by FPF. The one other thing I'd say that, that's interesting about this also, and I hadn't known about them before I started reporting this story, is this company Swix that operates in Central and Eastern Europe their net sales are going up exponentially. In 2015, their first year in operation, they had 5 million euros in sales. In 2020, it was 230 million. They're expecting to exceed 600 million euros in 2022. And I think a lot of that is going to be because they're taking over the activities of uh, Western biopharma companies in Russia and Belarus. All right, back to Washington, Steve. An unusually collaborative bipartisan effort, I don't get to say those words that often these days, is moving medical product user fee reauthorization bills forward in the House and the Senate. We already had the House bill. There's been some new developments. The Senate bill out of Health 
dropped a few days ago. Steve, what's the latest? So yeah, bipartisan legislation in Washington. It's not something that you hear much of these days. I, I actually think it would be really interesting for anybody who has the time to go back and look at the YouTube video, at least for a few moments, of the Energy and Commerce Committee's markup of the user fee bills. It was remarkable. There really was honest and legitimate collaboration and kind of focus on the public health aims of the legislation among members of both parties. All of the amendments and all of the legislation that has been attached to the House user fee bill is bipartisan. I think that's it's quite surprising and, and probably encouraging. So the House bill passed the um, Energy and Commerce Committee. They added to it legislation that modifies the Race for Children Act. That was a bill that was passed a few years ago that gives FDA the authority to require companies that are developing cancer drugs for adults conduct trials in children based on the molecular targets of the drugs rather than the organs where the, the cancers manifest themselves. The legislation that's been attached to, to the user fee bill gives FDA the authority to mandate combination trials of molecularly targeted drugs in children. Other than that, the legislation was pretty much the same as what the Energy and Commerce Committee's Health Subcommittee had passed. The main things I think that are of interest are provisions about clinical trials diversity and provisions in the legislation that enhance FDA's authority on accelerated approval. The Senate Health Committee has released uh, a discussion draft of the legislation which is more or less identical to the House in terms of reauthorizing the user fees. The thing that the Senate has added to it is the Valid Act. That's legislation that actually was conceived of by FDA under FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb that completely revamps the regulation of diagnostics, including laboratory-developed tests. Steve, I know that's been in the works for a while. Is it seem like something that could be smooth sailing, or might there be opposition to that revamp? I think that there's a strong sense in both houses of Congress that this is something that needs to get done. If I had to bet on it, I would bet it's more likely than not that the Valid Act, maybe with some, some changes, will go through. It's written in a way that doesn't really threaten the interests of companies that are marketing LDTs now. There's a, a generous grandfathering period and provisions for companies that are going to have to be regulated for the first time to have a graduated on-ramp to doing that. It emphasizes risk-based regulation. I think it's going to get over the finish line. I think it's going to make a big difference. And for those who haven't kept up with this, this is about harmonizing regulation of in vitro diagnostics, uh, which are tests that can be done at any laboratory and are distributed as sort of as kits broadly, and laboratory developed tests, which are developed within a company or, or institution and only conducted there. They've had separate regulatory avenues, and the Valid Act seeks to bring a harmonized framework for both of them. That's right. And then what it also does for both of them is it creates a risk-based framework. So FDA isn't trying to regulate every single test, every single lab test or every single in vitro test that's available to physicians, but rather it's, it kind of titrates the level of attention that FDA has to give to them based on the risks that the tests pose to individual health. All right. And Steve's story, which we published on Friday has two sweet tables that list a lot of the key elements of these bills. So it's a handy cheat sheet. And as Steve has said previously, this legislation needs to get signed by the president soon, or we will no longer have drugs approved. It's important. All right, all these stories are up on biocentury.com. One more biocentry story I'd like to call your attention to. We saw the first decisions from China's patent linkage laws. They highlighted a lack of transparency. That's what 
associate editor Stephen Hansen found out when he spoke with China IP expert and Jones Day partner Tony Chen, who has been a guest on this podcast in the past. Tony talks a bit more about what these decision means. Two cases, generics companies two, pharma companies zero. We'll continue to keep score as more decisions drop. All of BioCentury's podcasts are available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Google, an alphabet company. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for our podcast. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. Thanks for tuning in. We will catch you next Tuesday. Monday is a holiday in the United States. Thank you.